So I've been talking a lot about coding, uh, but let's take a step back and actually untangle what I mean by the term code. What is a code and what is the difference between a code and a theme? So again, as you'll see throughout this whole talk, is there's multiple ways that researchers use these terms. And it will come down to you in the way that you describe and decide to take them up or not. But I will describe two key different ways to conceptualize what a code is, again, drawing heavily on the work of Brown and Clark. So you can decide what works for you. And if you have a different way to use and define these terms, that's also fine. It just needs to be consistent. So throughout the whole research process, you need to be clear, clarify how you're using these terms and why. It also needs to be consistent with your theoretical paradigm. So Brown and Clark make a really great distinction uh, between two sorts of codes. One is the bucket and the other is the storybook. So these capture different levels and also different types of analysis. So in the way that I use the bucket code uh, is that the bucket really is the code. So we determine the code, we determine um, you know, this bucket, this shape of this bucket, uh, before going in to code our data. This can either be, you know, as a code book or in a more reflexive way. Um, and then we fill that bucket with what we find. So in the sense that the code is usually one word or two, i.e. fake news is a bucket code. I've gone through my data and I've said, okay, fake news means CNN, the Democratic Party, Deep State, so forth. A bucket code can be a good, uh, can be really valuable for the first level of analysis, but it doesn't yet tell us a story. So knowing that fake news means the CN CNN, the Democratic Party and Deep State doesn't yet tell us a whole lot. So here we use this code uh, to collect all these things. It's kind of a summary or it's kind of collects our observations of where this code is kind of popping up in our data and our documents. You know, we're filling the bucket. There's quite a lot of thematic analysis that ends there. And that's up to you, depending on your methodology and again, the research questions that you're asking. But if we want to go further and again, explore this meaning making and these processes, we need to go beyond the bucket. And this is where in the way I use these terms, the term code and theme are different. So when we're moving from a code, a bucket code to a storybook theme, um, the storybook I think is what's the useful kind of picture to have in your head. This is where we start to tell a story, hence storybook. We start to move to a next level of analysis. We're moving also beyond single words. So for example, using fake news. Fake news is the code, it's one or two words. Uh, you can also have child codes, i.e. the parent code is fake news. The child codes are CNN, the Democratic Party, or whatever else you find. The theme, or the storybook theme, is a statement. It's fake news captures all media that says negative things about Trump. These themes emerge through your analysis of the codes. So you don't have these themes before going into your data analysis. They are not part of your code book if you're doing that type of analysis. Rather, they come through the process or through the second or third level of analysis. The point here is to move from a code to a theme in that you're telling a story, you're making sense of the data through this interpretive lens. And again, you can start to see the importance of the researcher in this process because the decisions you make about what is a theme, how it's a theme, you know, is up to you and it needs to be documented and it needs to be justifiable. Hence, I'm going to repeat justifiable uh, throughout this process. So whether you're doing code book uh, or coding reliability or more reflexive coding, there are certain steps uh, to this research process. And again, don't take these as kind of gospel, rather take them as guides for how you could do this. The first is, okay, I have my pile of data, my documents, my transcripts. Do a first read through. 
familiarise yourself with that data. Then the first level of coding, um, whether you're yeah, developing a code book or more reflexive coding, uh, requires going back through that data, seeing what's emerging, dividing these kind of codes into positive or negative, uh, also being prepared that these may change. Are there new child codes or parent codes that need to happen? Then we do a second level of coding to start exploring the relationships between these codes. Can I start to group them in certain ways? What are the themes that are emerging? How would I write certain statements, i.e. themes, from these codes? Then, is there anything missing? Do I need to do another level of coding? Are there different relationships that are starting to emerge? And this is kind of a reflexive process. It can, you can think of it as a spiral. Um, it depends, again, on the research questions you're asking and how much uh, you want to immerse yourself in that data to answer those questions. At each of these steps, you need to justify your research decisions. And this is done in your research diary. Then your final step is writing this up as your thesis, as an article or whatever you're writing. Uh, and really, this is your chance to shine, your chance to tell that story that you've been developing and why you know, you've deemed certain themes as being more important than others. Okay, this can maybe feel a little bit abstract, but I want to show you how I did this in my own PhD using a really, really small example um, because obviously it's a very big project and I'm not going to bore you for hours about my whole methodology process. But I'm going to show you this example of taking a research question, developing a code, and then that next step. So, a simplified version of my research question was how are social movements struggling against water expropriation in Australia and Ireland? So one of the first codes that I developed from this research question that was also inform informed by my theory was expropriation. So this is the kind of parent code. Then I started to develop child codes. We can also think of child codes as subcodes, which included, to name some, enclosure, private property, water grabbing, regulation. Now I want to focus here on regulation. Within this code, I then developed positive, negative or neutral kind of subcodes. So when someone mentions in an interview transcript or in a document regulation, were they doing this in a positive way, negative way and so forth. Again, if you want to divide this into positive or negative will depend again on your research question and what you're trying to find out. Okay, using the example of regulation, I noticed that when politicians were using the term regulation, they were using it in a positive way. They were linking it to environmental protection. So in the case of Ireland, they were introducing water charges as a new regulation, as a way to protect the environment, and also to fund upgrades to leaky pipes and infrastructure. In contrast, social movement actors presented regulation as kind of neutral in the extent that regulation already existed to fund these leaky pipes, but they had been ignored by government. So what they started to do was link regulation to ineffective government, increased costs and also privatisation. So we can start to see how this code can be articulated in different ways. And that it is also this point of difference that is theoretically and kind of interesting for our research. It also highlights the way that we need to develop codes that capture this, i.e. are we looking at the positive, the negative, the relationships and so forth. So the message I want you to take away from this is that codes are only as useful as we make them. Again, the importance of you as researcher in this process. 